aren't, uh, you can find it right there in the back. Cool. Uh, I very much would like to thank the CME uh, board here at St. Vincent's East for the opportunity to come and chat with you on a topic I'm very passionate about. My name is Michael Kurz. I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine at UAB uh, downtown. You may know of that place. Uh, I'm also a physician scientist with the Alabama Resuscitation Center. Uh, I'm an ER trained, uh, uh, I'm emergency medicine by training. I spend most of my time now as a scientist uh, investigating uh, how to improve resuscitation, uh, how to improve outcomes from resuscitation. Um, and today what we're going to talk about is resuscitation systems of care to improve outcomes. Um, uh, I'm a, a scientist, as I mentioned, and so uh, the university really appreciates when um, I uh, disclose everything. <laughs> um, what you see on the screen there on the left side indicates that, in fact, uh, I have a research staff at the Alabama uh, Resuscitation Center. Uh, of, uh, I have six core staff, and I have 28 part-time staff. Uh, we accept uh, both uh, government or federal funding uh, and foundation funding and or industry funding in order to keep the lights on. Um, and so that's what you see there to the left side of that screen. Uh, to the right, um, you need to know that uh, I have a couple other relationships that uh, are relevant to my disclosures. I don't think are very relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first is I'm an American Heart Association volunteer. You may be able to tell that from the, the slide deck. Uh, this is a, a topic I speak uh, on on behalf of the American Heart Association. Um, and so I contributed both to the 2010 and the 2015 guidelines. When uh, you go to ACLS, or you go to, uh, well, ACLS really, when you go to ACLS and you, you learn, um, you know, whatever we like to choose this year, like uh, taking atropine out of the algorithm, um, that comes through a very rigorous scientific process that I have the opportunity to sit in on um, when the AHA revises the guidelines. In addition, uh, I have done some work for the Joint Commission. Um, you can boo and hiss now, uh, I'll just cue that. Um, uh, they are interested in putting together a uh, certification that would be for a comprehensive uh, cardiac arrest center and I got asked to be one of the uh, experts for uh, that initiative. And then finally, uh, I'm a board member for a, a tiny startup in Connecticut that makes a solid state oxygen generation system. Um, it's called Rapid Oxygen Company. Um, they make it mostly for uh, outpatient uh, office practices and military applications. Um, that's all to say uh, that what you're going to hear me talk about today is essentially uh, in no way influenced by this uh, other than uh, you're going to hear me talk about guidelines and evidence-based care that the American Heart Association endorses. That's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> With that, um, let's talk about a, a, a syst what is a system or a system of care. So a system is a set of detailed methods or procedures that you routinely carry out to perform a specific activity or a duty. It's an organized or purposeful structure that consists of a lot of moving parts so you can, get, so you can accomplish a goal. Um, the easiest one um, in this, to, the easiest analogy perhaps in this room to make is, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with our, our STEMI system of care, right? So in order to get folks to the cath lab when they're having a, an ST, elevation, uh, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or a big heart attack, um, uh, in order to get them from the point of recognition when they call 911 and are visited by uh, our pre-hospital providers to the point where they're in the lab uh, actually getting ballooned open in 90 minutes is an enormous feat. Uh, in or, uh, for those of you who are in the room are experienced enough, uh, not old, but experienced enough to remember the days before we had a STEMI system of care, you appreciate how many working parts are required um, uh, in order to do that. And in fact, uh, we've gotten so good at that system of care, right, that we almost now take it for granted. My residents, when I suggest that in the old days, uh, uh, the e emergency physicians didn't activate the cath lab directly, right, you called cardiology, um, uh, they're flabbergasted by this idea. Uh, and so if you take that system of care approach, right, and, and there are other wonderful models. Stroke has a wonderful system of care. Trauma is another great uh, classic example of a system of care. And you provide it or, or, or apply it to resuscitation, what you rapidly figure out is that what we have accomplished for trauma and accomplished for STEMI and accomplished for stroke, we could also accomplish for resuscitation. And why is that? 
the other analogy I like to talk about when we talk about systems of care is a symphony, right? So when you go to appreciate the symphony, you go to listen to a number of musicians, all playing in sync, all from the same sheet of music. It would be crazy to try to appreciate, say, Mozart or Bach by just saying, I'm just going to listen to, say, the first violin, okay? And so it is with this concept, when we talk about system of care, we wish that every part of the system is all reading from the same sheet of music so that we are doing things in parallel and not in series, and we all have the same goal involved. That's truly what a system of care is and, and why we don't want to be reinventing the wheel every time we search for that same goal. When we ask ourselves about cardiac arrest, it's important to know a little bit about the epidemiology. And so this question is, is kind of tongue in cheek, um, but it asks who's at highest risk for sudden death out of these folks. Uh, and what we know about cardiac arrest um, is that is essentially a random disease. Out of hospital cardiac arrest afflicts one in a thousand, essentially at random annually. And so, you know, frankly, I can tell you how many roughly cardiac arrests we're gonna have in, in the Birmingham metro area this year because I know how big the population is. And so the reality is that if 70% of the out of hospital arrests are random, then all of the folks on this list are at risk. I think we can all identify with them one way or another with our, either ourselves or our own family. And what that means is we need a strong system of care that at the community level has a number of stakeholders so that we can provide care for every one of these folks should um, the unthinkable happen. And so we're gonna start with a case study, all right, because this is how we learn as adults, is with case studies. And we're gonna talk about uh, Miss Rita J. Um, uh, Miss Rita, I had the pleasure to take care of, and she's given her permission so we can talk about her. Um, but uh, Miss Rita was uh, 57 years old. She was at the Heart Walk I guess in 2015, I think. Um, and uh, while she was there uh, at the Heart Walk, um, she actually had a VF arrest. Uh, just walking along the street. She wasn't running, she wasn't exerting herself. She, um, she was walking along the street, has a VF arrest during the Heart Walk of all places. Um, a bystander, as the first link in the chain of survival, steps out, recognizes the cardiac arrest, and immediately starts bystander CPR. That bystander was trained six years ago in a mass, in a mass uh, CPR training event uh, and called upon uh, that knowledge uh, that day in order to take care of Ms. Rita. And so the first link in the chain of survival is after the recognition that comes from calling 911 is the early application of high quality CPR. Right? And we accomplish this through many different channels or many different initiatives um, because not everyone learns the same and not everyone has the same opportunity to garner this training. And so the AHA has an enormous training network. There are 400,000 um, folks every year in the United States that, that uh, acquire CPR skills through our vast training network of almost 30,000 providers. Um, there are off-duty healthcare professionals. Um, you may have seen recently the, the applications you can get on your phone where uh, you can register and they will summon you to the site of a cardiac arrest. We don't have that here in Birmingham, but um, if you register um, for one of these applications and say you step off a plane in Austin, Texas, or you step off the plane in pretty much anywhere in California, um, uh, it immediately registers you as being there and geolocates you and then uh, will alert you if there's a cardiac arrest within, I don't know, 400 yards or something, so you can respond before EMS gets there. Um, we have mass casualty, uh, mass casualty, mass gathering training, right? I'm sure you've seen these where we fill stadiums once a year um, and, and train folks in, in CPR. Um, there's also CPR in schools. Um, and I'm real proud to be uh, a citizen of the state of Alabama uh, because Alabama is in fact, uh, uh, in 1981, pass legislation so that in order to graduate from a public school in Alabama, um, you have to receive CPR training. Um, there's also telephone CPR, and, and in the interest of full disclosure, I chaired the task force on telephone CPR. Telephone CPR is what we now uh, describe as uh, what we used to call dispatch CPR, or dispatch, uh, dispatch assisted CPR. 
Um, and that's where you call 911 and, and the, the dispatcher talks you through identifying the arrest and then if in fact you are a bystander at arrest, then gives you CPR, just-in-time CPR education instructions on how to provide hands-only CPR. Um, the reality is it takes about 20 seconds um, to provide uh, CPR instructions and in the state of Arizona, uh, there was wonderful literature published by Ben Barbaro this year, in the state of Arizona, it's responsible for two-thirds of the bystander CPR that's provided within that state. Um, we talked about hands-only CPR, right? We don't have to do mouth-to-mouth um, uh, -mouth or, or, or rescue breaths anymore if, if uh, we're concerned about infection risk, uh, except in very specific populations like kids or uh, drownings. Um, we have uh, this wonderful CPR kiosk. Uh, if you've been through the Atlanta airport, I believe it's in the B terminal, uh, where if you're stuck on a uh, stuck in the Atlanta airport and and uh, uh, you're on a layover and you got nothing else to do, <laughs> you can walk up to the kiosk uh, and it's uh, uh, in about 45 seconds you can learn CPR. Uh, and then um, uh, these are all ways in which we, we do this for our communities. Uh, and then this is the map of uh, uh, CPR in, in high schools and all the states that have adopted legislation uh, in order to graduate high school that you have to receive CPR training. You see Alabama is down there in the pre-2016. Uh, uh, we actually adopted, as I mentioned, that legislation in 1981. The only state that beat us is uh, Iowa, um, who adopted it, I think, the same year, a couple months earlier. Um, but as you can see now, uh, like 80% of high school students in the United States um, receive, uh, in 38 states, receive CPR education before they leave high school. Um, I mentioned this, the telephone CPR task force that, that I, I had the opportunity to chair. The beauty of telephone CPR is um, we know a couple things. One, the most, uh, the highest yield person uh, in order to train how to do CPR is the person who picks up the phone and calls 911. The beauty of that is it's not defined as only in public places, and we know the vast majority of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests actually happen in the ho private home. Um, uh, in addition, if you provide the instructions correctly um, uh, with word choice, uh, as in, uh, simple changes like, we, we're going to start CPR now, let me tell you how to do it, rather than asking the bystander if they'd like to try it. Um, simple word cho choices like that actually increase compliance by a factor of two. Uh, and so the highest yield uh, opportunity to improve CPR provision at the point of arrest, which is early and often, is with the application of telephone CPR. I'm, I'm very proud that uh, this is the new advocacy push by the American Heart Association. There will be a bill introduced this legislative session and Alabama um, uh, to provide telephone, all PSAPs, which is what uh, public safety answering points, that's what we call dispatch centers now. Um, interestingly, EMS is a lot like medicine where about every 10 years we have to change the acronyms so we continue to sound smart. Um, uh, uh, so uh, PSAP is the new dispatch center. Um, uh, but uh, all joking aside, in Alabama there will be legislation introduced this year that will uh, require all PSAPs to provide telephone CPR. We're hoping that it passes. And so when we provide that CPR, it's important that that CPR is, is provided in a manner that's, that is high quality. Right? Um, it does, while while I'd like some CPR versus no CPR, if given the option, right? If, if I further can, can choose, I'd like high quality CPR um, for me or my loved one. Um, there's a, a statement by the American Heart Association that clearly outlines um, how we ought to do CPR, right? This is the mini statement from 2013, and it has five uh, quality measures uh, that define high quality CPR. Those are chest compression fraction, okay, greater than 80%. And we used to talk about, uh, for those of you who've been doing this long enough, we used to talk about uh, appropriate chest compression fraction and inappropriate chest compression fraction, and uh, it, it doesn't matter anymore. This is raw chest compression fraction. When the person's heart has stopped, you should have hands on the chest more than 80% of the time, okay? Sh are there points at which you should stop? Yes, you shouldn't do CPR while you're doing rescue breaths. <laughs> Right? But for the rest of, or, or when you're shocking, right? That'd be bad. Um, but for the rest of the time, you should have hands on the chest. 
Okay, the way um, that you do that, uh, for my nursing colleagues who are in the room and watching at home, the way you do that is to empower the nursing staff to tell the doctors um, uh, that we're not going to stop unless there's some intervention that you absolutely have to make me stop for. Um, and so, for example, at my shop, um, we don't, uh, first of all, we don't let doctors do the CPR um, because uh, generally we do a bad job. Um, and two, honest to God, uh, like doctors in my ER don't do CPR anymore because we do a bad job. Um, and two, um, like only in medicine, right? So only, only in, in resuscitation would we take the most uh, evidence-based therapy, right, to correct the problem, which in this instance is quality CPR, and provide it not by the expert, okay, but by the most junior guy. Right, the medical student. Oh, have you never done CPR before? Here, come on, hop on the chest. <laughs> right? O only in resuscitation would we let that happen. Um, and, and so uh, uh, my nursing staff does the, the compressions and, and we don't stop uh, unless uh, there's absolutely a compelling reason to stop. And so the default is that you've got hands on the chest the entire time. Um, the rate uh, is clearly prescribed. It's between 100 and 120 um, compressions a minute. The depth should be uh, approximately two and a half inches, uh, or for those of you who enjoy the metric system, um, that's about 50 millimeters. Uh, the recoil is important, so leaning on the chest. When folks get tired and they've done CPR for a while, what they tend to do is lean on the chest. What that prevents is the recoil of the chest to provide negative pressure and flow back to the heart, and is actually ca uh, counterproductive. Um, and so recoil is very, a very important part of that. And finally, the number of ventilations. Uh, when you look at uh, folks who are not following a metronome or, or following a, a prescribed pattern of CPR, what you find is that uh, we very often, uh, because the adrenaline is flowing, uh, overventilate to the tune. Sometimes in the rock trials we saw, um, you know, 30 ventilations a minute. Um, that is exactly like providing no recoil because all you do is increase their intrathoracic pressure and, and they, don't, um, they don't ever have an opportunity for the heart to fill again when you compress. Gosh, that was a lot about, about CPR quality that I just harped on. And the reason why I wanted to talk a lot about CPR quality is one, how important it is as part of the system of care, and two, everyone thinks they do really good CPR, okay? It's a lot like how good of a driver you are. So on the left of the screen here, you see that Allstate every year does a survey of, of drivers in America, all right? They pick a 1,000 drivers and they ask them, are they a good driver? And 64% of Americans say, yes, I'm a great driver, okay? So first of all, we know that that's not possible. Okay. Second of all, they say that only 30% of their best friends are drivers, are good drivers, right? And only 20% of folks my age are a good driver, right? What this demonstrates is there is a huge gap, okay, between perception of how well you do, say, driving, or another important psychomotor skill, CPR, and what actually happens. And so if you look at the graph on the, on the right side of your screen, that is a uh, direct evidence that demonstrates that the perception of are you doing high quality CPR and then the lighter uh, bars in the graph show are they actually doing high quality CPR. And what we find is exactly um, the same as when we survey drivers, that the perception is that we do great CPR and the reality is that we most of the time that we don't. Uh, getting, getting trained every two years to provide quality CPR, if that's your only opportunity, is simply not often enough. Why is this a big deal? All right, and not just because there's an AHA statement that says it is, but this is a simple paper by Shel my buddy Sheldon in, 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 California, in California, in Canada, uh, <coughs> examining the resuscitation outcomes data that demonstrates that if your pre-shock pause is longer than 10 seconds, your chance of that shock being successful drops by half. 10 seconds, right? That's nothing. It took me longer to explain this, right, than it did than 10 seconds. But for a person whose heart has stopped, when the CPR that you're doing is providing the modest coronary, uh, cardiac output and you stop that CPR, 10 seconds is an eternity, all right? These are the simple changes 
that we can do in the quality of CPR that we provide that clearly have demonstrable results when we talk about will you survive your cardiac arrest. Um, this is a, another slide. This is from Dana Edelston in, in resuscitation in 2006. Uh, this is from in-hospital arrests. And what you find is the chance of shock success as you move from less than 10 seconds on the left side of the screen, 94% of shocks were, uh, first shocks were successful, to a greater than 30 second pause. Only th a third of those shocks were successful. Um, again, clear, 30 seconds doesn't seem like a lot of time. Right? That, I have seen airways take longer than 30 seconds. That's why we don't stop for airway anymore when we're doing compressions. Right? You may remember we made a change now. Uh, prior to the 2015 uh, 2010 guidelines, right, we harped all the time, a ABC, right, airway first. Why did we change to CAB? Why did we change to circulation, then airway, then breathing? The reason we changed is because there was good data that demonstrated that if you did airway first, CPR on average didn't get started for two minutes. If you reversed them and you started with compressions first, the airway was only delayed on average 18 seconds, okay? As a medical director of, a, of an EMS service, as a physician, as a resuscitation science, that's an easy exchange to make, man. I will happily take 18 seconds without an airway for two minutes of compressions. I can have you back and perfusing in two minutes if I get those compressions. And so what we have seen in the evolution of the guidelines from 2010 to 2015 is the elimination of, of the distractions and the, the, the consolidation of the duty cycle, right? So this is the new AHA guideline on, on how we do CPR. And as you can see, it is a continuous circle, right? It's about the duty cycle. You start CPR, you do CPR for two minutes, you do everything that else you have to do within your pulse check, right? Which in a good system, your pulse check should be six seconds. And then you go back to the chest again, right? So who is experienced enough to remember the days of the universal algorithm back in 05, right? ACLS was six posters. Right, you went to you 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 came down the ACLS algorithm and you got to step 34B, right? Go to poster 6C, right? So you, you, for the folks who who don't remember, there are were not providers during this time. This is truly how it used to be, right? There was this very complicated algorithm. Or who's experienced enough to remember the days of Bertillium? right? As a, as an ACLS drug, certainly if you got all the way down the algorithm to Bertillium. Right, they were going to be dead by then. <laughs> right, uh, all of that is gone now, and it's because we've recognized what really saves lives: it's early access to defibrillation and high-quality CPR. We've taken out all the other miscellaneous drugs, except for antiarrhythmics and, and epinephrine. So back to Miss Rita. Now that we've harped on CPR for a little bit, back to Miss Rita. So Miss Rita gets shocked twice by a public access defibrillator, all right? Um, so what is public access defibrillation? Uh, it is the provision of a defibrillator in public places for the use by the lay public. Um, when we first put defibrillators in O'Hare Airport in 04, the FDA was sure that people were gonna take those things off the wall, hook up their friend, and see what happened when you shocked them. Now, honest to God, the FDA was concerned we were going to be killing people with them. And what we found is that, A, the algorithm is too good, right? The, if the AED says to shock and you deliver a shock, 999 times out of 1,000, it is correct. And number two, nobody wants to do that, <laughs> right? And so now you see AEDs in many public places. The reality is we need them as ubiquitous as fire hydrants. Right? You would never, right, by code, we would never occupy a building that does not, a modern building, that does not have sprinklers and fire alarms and does fire drills, right? How many, I don't know about your hospital, how often is your fire alarm tested? Right? Well, all the time, once a month for me, right? What if we had that same testing for uh, automated external defibrillation? I'll tell you right now, in the United States, there will be significantly more people who will die this year from their out-of-hospital cardiac arrest than will die in fires. 
by like a factor of 100. So in that chain of survival, the bystander shocks Miss Rita twice. She gets a phone call to 911. The EMS bike team was actually was there and responded during the heart walk. She got uh, uh, early ACLS and after two rounds of uh, in the duty cycle, um, she gets ROSC. ROSC is return of spontaneous circulation. Um, uh, or you may re hear it referred to as ROSCI. That's a, getting a pulse back. So things to remember when you call 911. So up until about a month ago when Apple finally gave in and said that they will transmit accurate GPS coordinates along with a phone call, what happened when you picked up your cell phone and called 911? The first thing they did was ask the caller where you were coming from, where you were, because there was no way to triangulate your position except in the largest municipalities where you could hit three cell towers and triangulate where you were. Uh, and so a lot of time in dispatch used to, get used to happen acquiring a, a, um, a uh, uh, a position in which to send EMS. They need an address to go to. Uh, this was highlighted, my five-year-old is getting ready to go to first grade next year, and, and uh, one of the things to be ready for first grade is, uh, can, you, can you recite your phone number? And uh, my wife and I haven't had a landline in five years. And so what we figured out is that, you know, in the old days, the landline automatically populated with an address uh, at dispatch. Uh, you know, I had to teach my son my cell phone number. Um, uh, and that highlighted now the need for being able to provide your location. Um, uh, but it highlights the need for the dispatcher to stay on the phone uh, with the bystander to provide CPR instructions. So because Miss Rita gets picked up by a high-performing EMS system, she gets a 12 lead route to UAB. And this is her 12 lead. And for those of you who don't routinely interpret these in the field, let me tell you, this is, this is the Widowmaker, right? Um, this is a big, bad STEMI. It's a big, high LED lesion, right? These are the people who arrest, re arrest and die. Guess what? That's what Miss Rita tried to do, right? And so this needs to go to the lab, all right? And this is a chip shot. So coronary disease is the most common cause of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and then in your system of care, there needs to be a destination decisions, right? Where does this, where does Miss Rita go? Maybe the closest appropriate hospital is not, uh, the closest hospital is not the most appropriate hospital for her because she needs to go to the cath lab, right? And she needs to be cared by a multidisciplinary team uh, that, that takes care of cardiac arrest folks all the time. Um, and so the crew bypasses the nearest hospital and, and, and she gets taken to us at, at, at UAB. And she gets activated, the cath lab gets activated from the field, all right? And why is this a very important characteristic of the system of care? It's because we've proven now that not only can ER doctors, right, activate the cath lab and do it well, but that EMS providers can be taught to activate the cath lab um, with no intervention at all in the ED, no transmitting the electrocardiogram, um, and they're right nine out of 10 times. Why is this a big deal for those of you who are administrators or you're, uh, you, you know about your CMS cardiology uh, uh, metrics, right? What is the dreaded uh, metric that you don't want? It's off-peak hours, right? Mortality off-peak. And what EMS activation demonstrates, uh, this is a paper from one of my former fellows, uh, Teresa Camp Rogers, uh, demonstrates that you eliminate the off-peak hour burden uh, by simply allowing the, the medics uh, to activate the cath lab. Um, and then this is, you know, this is an obvious slide that we, we all know from DeLuca from like 2005. Um, and what it demonstrates is that there is a clear uh, relationship between how quickly you go to the cath lab and your mortality. DeLuca demonstrated that it was a 7.5% increase in mortality for every 30 minutes of delay going to the lab. All right. The answer is get him to the lab, get him there fast, and get the artery open. But wait a minute, right? I'm advocating for the post-arrest patient to go to the lab. Aren't they, aren't they comatose, right? What if, are they gonna survive? Why do I wanna take these folks to the lab? And the answer is because um, this is uh, wonderful meta-analysis data from resuscitation. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the weighted hazard effects model, that's a, a very jiffy statistical model to demonstrate uh, which of two therapies is better. 
okay? Um, so on this graph you see on the left side, um, that just blinked for some reason, on the left side uh, is, a, is a line down the middle which is essentially uh, both therapies are equal. Um, the compilation of all of these trials together and the diamond at the bottom uh, trending to the right side of your screen demonstrates that um, going to the cath lab directly impacts survival from cardiac arrest. In fact, to the tune somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half times, right? If you have an arrest, you want to go to the cath lab and have your artery opened. And so, um, uh, when we attempt to convince our, our cardiology colleagues of this, um, that, uh, we're, we talk about what the actionable data is as they come through um, the door, and is that the electrocardiogram, right? So, so uh, let's just compare for a moment where the actionable data is when we talk about the electrocardiogram in the post-arrest patient. Um, in the middle, right, uh, so let me direct you to the middle first. Uh, this was the original paper I published in 2017. It was the first paper in the emergency medicine literature that said um, ER doctors can activate the cath lab and we had to provide numbers in order to convince folks that, that we could do this. And what you see is that roughly 95 to 96 percent of the time we are right. Okay, so, so uh, let, let's just use round numbers. Um, when, we, when ER docs looked at an electrocardiogram and said that was a STEMI and activated the cath lab, um, we got overruled correctly only one out of 20 times. Okay, let's compare that to uh, Dr. Camp's uh, other work um, in EMS activation of the cath lab, and you see the same statistical numbers there, um, that indicates that given very rigorous training, your EMS agency in a high-performing system that does this routinely can activate the cath lab and be correct nine out of 10 times, all right? When we compare that to data on whether or not the electrocardiogram is actionable to predict a lesion in the cath lab, for the out of hospital cardiac arrest patient, you can see Dumas's work for the positive predictive value. If you have a STEMI on your electrocardiogram, that's a chip shot. Like Miss Rita, that's a chip shot. Right? She clearly has an LAD lesion. All right? If you have, the, the, and that's great. Unfortunately, post cardiac arrest, the vast minority, probably around 10%, have that electrocardiogram. For those of you who have taken care of the post arrest patient, right, what does their electrocardiogram always look like? A hot mess. Right? Very rarely does it look ischemic. It's normally wide and nasty and, and narrows up over the course of 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and it's, it's a hot mess, right? When it's in that hot mess, right, where it's not clearly ischemic, that electrocardiogram is no better than a flip of a coin, all right, on demonstrating whether or not there's a lesion to be found in the cath lab that's intervenable, all right? Certainly, we would not go to the cath lab based on the flip of a coin and that's not where the data drives us, so we should not use the electrocardiogram as actionable data in order to determine whether or not we go to the cath lab with the post-arrest patient. Why do we have this hesitation in, in American medicine for this system of care? Why do we hesitate to take the patient who arguably, right, would, va would, va uh, would, would do the best, would benefit the most from going to the cath lab, and why do we find reasons not to go? And the reason is because of publicly reportable data. This is the statement from Mimi Pepperdy in 2013, um, drafted on the behalf of the American Heart Association, that demonstrates how at a smaller volume center, it only takes a handful of bad outcomes in order to wreck your numbers. I don't know about you folks, um, but I can't go to a faculty meeting, um, or a division meeting, or a department meeting without someone uh, in a suit like I'm wearing now, because I don't normally wear a suit, um, saying, you know, before you're going to discuss, insert esoteric thing that we discuss at faculty meetings, and trust me, we can find esoteric things to talk about. Um, let's review our mortality numbers for the last month, quarter, year, whatever the interval is, right? Why is that important? It's because A, they're publicly reportable, but B, we're a value-based, value-purchasing, healthcare uh, system now, and what that means is your, your, your reimbursement is directly uh, tied to how well you do these things. And in reality, the only difference when you look at the PROCAT data um, uh, out of uh, Denmark, the only difference between a cohort of patients who go for their elective um, uh, PCI uh, procedure, right, an elective cath uh, for intervention, 
and your post-arrest patients. The only difference between the two cohorts is that you take a 10 times mortality hit um, uh, based on the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. When you look at the distribution of their disease, whether you're gonna find any, which vessels you're gonna find it in, do they have single vessel disease, bivessel disease, multivessel disease, it's all the same. Because guess what? It's almost exactly the same population. The single difference is that you take a 10 time mortality hit and you can see clearly from this statement what that means in terms of a hospital with not a whole lot of, uh, of cath lab volume. And so I'm very proud uh, that as part of the work we've done with the American Heart Association with the new ECC president, Carl Kern, we have championed the idea that we were gonna change the NCDR registry with our colleagues at ACC. Um, NCDR is the, the National Cath Lab Registry um, so that mortality is reported first in a conglomerate, uh, all bucket, uh, all comer uh, population as it is now. But in addition, there'll be a second reporting where out of hospital cardiac arrests i.e. if you had CPR before arriving in the lab are taken out of the equation. Um, and so that number will also be publicly reportable. So when you hit the ED, so Miss Rita hits the ED, we activate the lab, we go up to the lab, you don't stop in the ED unless they, are on, they have CPR in progress again or Right, you think they're so unstable that they're not gonna make the trip to the lab. Um, I'm not really sure about your facility here, but at my shop, the cath lab is six floors up. Right, we've timed it. It is easily seven minutes from my ED to the cath lab table. And so if that's the case, I gotta make sure that they're gonna survive the seven minute trip. All right, um, and so that's the only reason we stop, um, because I don't think they're gonna make it. Um, so as an ER physician, that kind of pains me. The reality is that the, I offer, other, short of keeping them stable enough to get to the cath lab, the emergency department arguably off, offers nothing that the, the, the cath lab doesn't, unless you wanna talk about eCPR, and, and, and we do some of that at, at UAB. Other than, other than the provision of ECMO in the ED, we don't offer anything the cath lab doesn't. So, you go to the, so Miss Rita goes to, to the cath lab, she gets ballooned open, she in fact has that high LED lesion I referred to. And then she gets transferred out to the CCU where a multidisciplinary service, of which I'm the director, uh, takes care of her. We have five attending physicians that do, um, that take call for the service, we're up 24-7, 365. Um, between the five physicians, we have about 40 years of experience taking care of these folks. Um, we probably do over 50 a year, and you get multidisciplinary care from the point at which uh, you hit the ED all the way through to your recovery, and including we see these folks in survivor clinic um, uh, after they leave the hospital. Uh, that provides, in addition, what we used to call hypothermia, uh, and we now call it targeted temperature management. We provided it at 33 degrees. Um, uh, again, we change the acronyms occasionally so we sound smart. Um, it's all the same. Um, in addition, uh, a plan for hemodynamics, ventilator management, neurologic assessment, and uh, neuroprognostication uh, based on continuous EEG five days after the fact. And so Rita does great, and she makes it out to the floor, and, and she's doing very well. And then one night, the MET team gets called, or you may call it RRT, uh, gets called because Rita uh, fires off a surveillance um, warning based on the early warning system on her vital signs and her lab values. And so what I wanna highlight real quick is that there's also a system of care for in-hospital cardiac arrest. All right, uh, at the top there you see, uh, excuse me, at the bottom you see um, the classic AHA airbrushed, uh, very pretty uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival. Um, at the top is the in hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival. And while it looks not a whole lot different at the end, what is very important is at the beginning it starts not with uh, identification, uh, not with uh, activation of the emergency system, but in, in fact it starts with prevention, right? Uh, I, uh, the best way that you can improve your in-hospital cardiac arrest uh, survival is not to have them. And so when we look at in-hospital cardiac arrest, um, your resuscitation committee uh, as part of this system of care should not just observe, you know, did we follow the algorithm? Does the code sheet reflect what was happened? Did we do our epi at the right intervals or our pulse checks at the right intervals? In addition, um, part of the system of care for in-hospital cardiac arrest means that you surveil these folks 
and that you look at the 12 hours or 24 hours of data that you have before their arrest. Because what you find when you look at that data is that in between a third and a half of in-hospital cardiac arrests, they are both A, predictable, and B, preventable. All right, in-hospital cardiac arrest is not a random disease like out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. A large portion, arguably the majority, are both predictable and preventable. And so um, that's very important, that in-hospital system of care is very important to improve survival from, from in-hospital arrest. Um, what we have found is that uh, in institutions that have uh, instituted that, um, there has been direct economic benefit to the hospital, in some cases, uh, direct reduction in malpractice cost uh, for the physicians involved uh, in that response. It goes beyond having a code team. Um, this is not just having a code mob or, or, or it's actively having surveillance and then after the event, um, it's about debriefing um, when you have data. This is the way we do it at UAB. Um, this looks a lot like the trauma diagram for the trauma team because guess what, it is. Uh, mm -hmm. The names are just changed to protect the innocent and the different, the different roles at the cardiac arrest. But as you can see, everyone has a defined role up to the first nine people and then at n person number 10, guess what? I don't need you, okay? I don't need more people in the room. The last thing I need is more people in the room. Uh, this is designed to be scalable uh, and so you can run this thing with two people, the, the nurse, uh, uh, who recognizes the event, or, or, or frankly, anyone on the unit who recognizes the event, and the first responding nurse. After the event, there needs to be a period of debriefing. All right, this has also been clearly proven uh, to reduce the incidence and mortality from in-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, there are kind of three fla two flavors of debriefing that are described in the literature. There is the hot debriefing, Right, so immediately following the arrest when, when, the, when the patient is finally stable, you grab the staff who is all involved and you huddle up real quick and you spend five minutes talking about what went well and what didn't. Right. That's wonderful, okay? Um, the downside to that is oftentimes you get a lot of perception uh, communicated and unless there is a glaring uh, issue that needs addressed, um, you get a lot of, that a boy, good job, that went well. Um, gee, that CPR was great. Um, Right? The opposite to that, or on the other extreme, is the cold debriefing, and that's often what get happens in your, in your resuscitation committee, um, and that's where you actually have data to pull a week or maybe even a month later, um, where you pull the data and you look at the code sheet, and if you're really advanced, you pull the defibrillator data and look at your CPR process times and your perishock pause, and, and you're able to say, gee, for 28 seconds here, this guy just was in VF, and we, it looks like we didn't do anything, what happened? It's kind of hard a week after the fact to remember what happened. And so at UAB, we've, we have instituted the warm debriefing. So before the end of the shift, uh, the staff huddles up. In addition, the data is pulled and sent to the server. It spits out a report, um, and then we're able to pass out a copy of that report to the entire staff, and so we're able to debrief with um, some data. And so while it's fresh in everyone's mind, and it just happened in the last 12 hours, we can actually look at the report and say, um, gosh, there's this 28 second pause, what happened? Well, actually everyone remembers because you know, it just happened the last couple hours. Debriefing is important because this is not about assigning blame. It is about identifying problems, uh, planning to overcome those problems, uh, uh, intervening on those problems and then evaluating that intervention. And this is a continuous cycle as you see, the plan, do, check, act cycle uh, that appears in, in chapter four of the, uh, the AHA guidelines uh, in hospital systems of care for cardiac arrest. And then Rita uh, gets to go home because she does really well and we prevent her second in hospital arrest. She gets a wearable I, uh, ICD to go home because she needs revascularized. Um, and uh, so she goes home uh, with 14 days of secondary prevention um, uh, from that wearable ICD. She then goes to cardiac rehab. And then um, what's also very important is the AHA, I, and I'm, uh, again, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm uh, the senior author on the paper. Um, there will be a coming uh, statement this year from the American Heart Association on survivorship following your arrest. Uh, the beauty of resuscitation science is that we've come so far in the last uh, 10 years that there uh, is no longer this unicorn that you knew of uh, where somebody you knew who knew somebody who once saw somebody survive their arrest. Um, <laughs> right? It used to be a unicorn. 
Uh, it certainly was when I was a pre-hospital provider in the late 90s. Um, now we have a critical mass of, mass of folks who survive, and they survive their arrest, and they go on to their lives. Um, and uh, they go out into the world, and there is absolutely no guidance at all as to what to do with them. Right? And, men, and when you talk to survivors, uh, they say, my GP kind of gives me a, a pat on the back every time I go and see them, and I have a bunch of other issues um, that I'm afraid to talk about because I should just be so lucky to be alive. Um, and so if we think, for example, that after your MI, there's about a one in three incidence of depression at six months, or we think that following a stroke Right? There's an a incidence of, of psychological uh, impact of roughly 50% at one year. Then certainly after your tragic cardiac arrest, uh, we can't, I can't imagine that there is not the same psychological impact. That just talks about the psychological ch uh, challenges. There are neurocognitive challenges. There's work-life integration. Um, there's also how do you care for their various medical, we haven't talked about their medical problems yet and integrating them back in to the healthcare system. And so the American Heart Association is very proud to author a statement uh, this year on uh, giving guidance on how to take care of survivors uh, when they leave the hospital. What kind of PT and OT requirements do they have? When do you refer to a psychiatrist, et cetera? Um, it's very needed um, and we're very happy to lead that charge. And that's all good news because like I said, we, we now have a critical mass. It's not just unicorns out there. Um, for who are surviving uh, out of hospital rest. Uh, and with that, um, thank you all very much for humoring me. If I can just take one more moment of your time, uh, the American Heart Association has been very good for me and this is a very personal issue. Um, my daughter there at the bottom, uh, as you see, is Claire. She just turned 11. Um, she's the catcher for an A-class uh, softball team. Uh, Claire has very complex congenital heart disease uh, and, um, whoops, you wanna look at the pretty pictures of my family, not the. Um, <laughs> Uh, Claire has uh, a very complex congenital heart disease, has acquired two and a half hours of pump time in her th two surgeries, has been in the cath lab three times and has uh, experienced a five minute arrest. And she is like every other kid you see, um, uh, except she's got a zipper in her chest. Um, and, oh, my kids again. Um, and, the reason why, and the reason why is because in the cath lab when she was down five minutes, she got outstanding CPR. Um, I like the razzle-dazzle as much as everybody else, right? It's very sexy to give drugs and arrest and to do procedures. I'm, I'm an ER guy, right? Of course it's sexy to do st stuff like that. <laughs> um, the reality is that the single intervention that, that from a system of care standpoint and from an out of hospital cardiac arrest standpoint that fixes or, or improves outcomes is quality CPR. And so that ought to be our focus when we resuscitate folks when they're, they're pulseless so that we figure out at the end when they survive that we've all been working from the same sheet of, sheet of music. And so with that, I, I very much welcome your questions. Thank you all very much for having me.